Ladies and gentlemen, we are also having other uh, presentation in Anjaniya Hall, which is session B. So you can also uh, look for the contents. Hello, we are going to start our session A. Um, the presentation is about marketing sustainable tourism, which is part two, need to travel. So let's welcome our moderator, Dr. Xavier Font. Welcome him with a round of applause. Okay, thanks for coming back. That was a great lunch, wasn't it? I'm, uh, I'm really pleased that we, we did it the way, the way it worked. And um, you know, very good choice. Um, so we spoke earlier on today about uh, mainstreaming uh, sustainability through better marketing in the mainstream, in the larger businesses and, and tourist destinations. And now what we're going to look at for the second half is saying, well, actually there is a very good tradition in marketing sustainability in niche travel. Uh, very often we've called it ecotourism, but there's many ways of labeling uh, aspects of this market. And we've got a, a range of experiences here being presented to us. And uh, we're going to start with a presentation from Mr. William uh, Niemeyer. Yeah, okay, close enough. Okay, my Dutch isn't great. And um, uh, please take your the stand. Um. Good afternoon, everybody. Does it work? It works. Good afternoon. It was indeed a, a very good lunch, wasn't it? And an excellent morning as well with uh, excellent speakers this morning. In particular, the last panel uh, was quite impressive and uh, I'm glad there is a lunch between the last panel and my presentation because there's quite a gap between having the heads of uh, WWF, uh, UNWTL, uh, the TUI group uh, sustainability head and my uh, presentation but I think that's the, the point going to um, um, talk a little bit more about the niche and a bit more about uh, experiences on the ground. And while on the word uh, experience, I wanted to put my presentation in the context of experiential travel because that is what our companies uh, specialize in and obviously may and make the link between sustainability and experiential travel, which you could say is a niche, but uh, it won't be for much longer. Um, Right, so I want to talk about uh, three different things in my presentation. The number one is uh, talk about the concept of the experience economy. You probably know about it. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about it, and in particular with regards to tourism. Second part I want to talk about is about visitor dispersion uh, to make growth more sustainable. And the last part of my presentation will be uh, giving four practical examples of how uh, we, our companies, have uh, made the uh, above two things and put them together and made them into niche products. All right, you, um, um, let me explain about the uh, experience economy with this uh, um, very nice slide. Um, I use this because um, the experience economy is probably best to be explained with the, uh, uh, the example of Starbucks uh, because we all know coffee, we just had coffee, just happened to be not uh, being Starbucks. But I can tell you exactly that's a good example of what I mean with the experience, with the experience economy. Uh, coffee itself starts its, uh, its life as a commodity. It's the coffee beans, it's what the farmers uh, produce. And then the next step in e economy would be uh, going into goods. Means it's packaged, it's measured, and then it's being sold on. The next part in the economy would be uh, providing a service. And providing a service is, you know, having an actual brewed cup of coffee, much as you got here uh, just after lunch. Uh, you pour yourself a cup and that's it. The next step, and that is where we are uh, continue to, uh, to grow as an economy in all different parts of the economy, including tourism, is actually uh, delivering uh, an experience out of this. And obviously you can know this very well by, uh, by uh, Starbucks. People pay a lot more for a cup of coffee from Starbucks than they do just getting, pouring themselves a cup of coffee after lunch. Um, 
There are a number of differences. Um, uh, you probably know them. Um, one of the things that I thought was uh, worth mentioning is the difference between a service and an experience is that the service is delivered on demand. So it is a one-time transaction. Whereas an experience is going to be delivered over a longer time. So that is a big uh, difference between the two uh, items and why there is also a premium on an experience than, uh, than there is on a uh, on service. To tourism. So, uh, commodities in tourism, there are plenty of them. Uh, after all, every product is made up from uh, commodities, also service products. Um, and I'm having here uh, just a um, uh, uh, um, uh, bit of a, a board here for uh, the different hotel rooms that you can get in. And uh, my colleagues who are in the hospitality trade don't like me saying this, but usually travelers do not come to a country because of the hotel. Uh, much as the different hotels try to make them come to the hotel uh, because of the hotel, it just simply isn't true. Uh, people go for different, different reasons to hotels. They go uh, more and more to get an experience. Um, this is in particular true for the millennial, uh, millennial generation. Uh, the millennials from a recent study have shown that more than three quarters of millennials during their holiday want to either experience a culture, a new culture that they haven't uh, experienced yet, or they want to learn something. Uh, they want to learn something and take something back with them. Um, and on the subject of uh, hotels with millennials, millennials more and more try, are choosing hostels rather than hotels. And they do this because of a more uh, conducive and a more um, uh, um, interesting mix and they get into touch with their fellow travelers who think alike. So this is really what uh, people are, uh, are, are expecting. They want to get experience, they want to get in-depth, they want to have an authentic experience, they want to connect with the, uh, the local population and they want to learn something. Um, one of the things that, uh, that's obviously uh, great is uh, by taking slower means of travel, transport. Um, so uh, get out of the bus and go either uh, on a walking tour uh, by public transport. It's basically also a very good way to, uh, to meet locals. And obviously there's the bicycle, which is um, uh, probably one of the most sustainable, if not the most sustainable uh, form of transport that we have other than walking. So that's for um, the experience economy. The next part, what I wanted to talk about is visitor dispersion. And visitor dispersion is very uh, important. And this is in particular so for Southeast Asia, which happens to be the region where uh, our companies uh, do business, uh, because uh, we are in a, a close proximity of, uh, of China, and China, as we all know, is a booming outbound market. Uh, I heard this morning that um, uh, Korea is now on the top of the list of uh, the wish list of the Chinese outbound traveler. Uh, Thailand is in that same uh, short list of, uh, of travelers. And uh, that um, poses uh, a particular challenge for uh, Asian destinations. Um, and I'm taking here Thailand as an example, but I also uh, um, touch on a couple of other uh, destinations that we handle uh, where, we, where we are uh, present. But Thailand is a good example because they have been in tourism for a very long time already and they're very well known as a tourist destination. In fact, actually, uh, very often I get a remark uh, when um, uh, people approach me that Thailand is very touristy. And uh, people might be right if they, uh, if you look at some of the areas in Thailand, like for example, this one is in, uh, in Phuket, then clearly this is very touristy and not in a very positive way either. Um, however, I want to put that in context and I like to put it in context between Thailand and France for the reason that both countries are uh, equal size, almost equal in uh, population, um, so they compare very well. Um, Thailand for this year aims at around about 28 million tourists. France, on the other hand, uh, aims for around about 80 million. There might be a little dent in it since the, uh, since the attacks earlier, but, uh, but still, around 80 million. Um, Thailand uh, is frequently perceived as a touristy destination, while France definitely is not. 
And the reason for that is that France obviously has been longer at it and they have been able to, uh, uh, to disperse visitors throughout the entire country. Basically every province or whatever they call it in France actually has tourists coming and uh, people seek out those destinations other than the touristy destinations, particular because it's more quiet. So they've been very successful in that. Um, this morning also I found it very interesting, there was something talk about how to map out uh, tourism activity in a, in a destination by using geotagging. It would be very interesting to do that in a destination like Thailand because you will get not more than probably five or six hotspots of tourists and the rest of the country will be virtually devoid of any tourism. So it's not a touristy destination, it just needs a lot of uh, attention on how to disperse uh, uh, visitors. Um, notwithstanding that, I mean, we still as a traveler like to see the highlights. Um, I can say that I, I would think that every first time visitor to France would like to at least see the Eiffel Tower and if possible climb it. Um, so that's the same thing in Asia. Uh, we can't really get people not to visit the highlights. They want to see Angkor Wat and they want to see the uh, Grand Palace in, um, in, in Bangkok. But what we can influence is how they are going to, uh, to see it, uh, what they're going to do when they are at those highlights, and what else they are going to do to spread their attention and their, uh, ultimately their tourism dollar. So that leads me to the third part of my presentation that gives you four different examples, and the examples are practical examples on uh, what mostly uh, our uh, inbound uh, travel company, Kiri Travel, is doing and a little bit also our other companies. I can uh, go on with uh, 20, 40 examples, but I uh, chose just four, and I chose the four as being quite different. Um, and I hope they inspire some of you who are in charge of being able to make some changes, that it is relatively easy to make uh, an experiential product, travel product that just needs a little bit creativity and thinking about the same things that we talked about, other panels talked about this morning. Um, what we'll do in uh, destinations, in all our destinations actually, is provide picnic lunches. Picnic lunches are uh, a fantastic way to get out of uh, um, a tourism uh, restaurant or even a local restaurant and to do something that is private, that is, cust that is not just customized, but it's really private for people. You can really personalize an experience. But most of all, um, it also uh, creates uh, a job opportunity. And since we do this in all our destinations, this picture happens to be in Chiang Mai. We also do this in uh, Sri Lanka, where uh, we approach local uh, population nearby the spot where we want to, uh, local community nearby the spot where we want to uh, do such a picnic lunch and ask them to become our hosts and obviously earn money of that. So we have locals preparing the picnic lunches and be present and connect with the travelers. So it's a fairly easy thing to do. And immediately uh, provides uh, income for uh, people that normally would be out of the uh, tourism economy. Second part is a little bit more complicated, uh, um, but I'll rush through it as an example, is what we do in, uh, we do with, uh, within Kiri Travel a lot of cross-border uh, travel, meaning we go from one country to the other country with a, by means of overland rather than flying. Uh, in itself obviously uh, a great way of travel, but it means that we are limited to um, less uh, developed infrastructure, let's put it like that. So we developed a trip that does an overland between Thailand and Yangon in Myanmar, and you go to an area which is very interesting because there are no tourists, but that means there's also no infrastructure for uh, tourists either, nor is there any um, particular things to do. So what we did, we saw this uh, area had uh, uh, great canals and small rivers, beautiful cave. So we uh, looked out for a local restaurant uh, to, um, uh, which happened to have a quite entrepreneurial owner, a lady. And we uh, gave her uh, the use of eight kayaks and uh, proceeded by training uh, some of the villagers to become the kayak guides. And we take uh, clients out of uh, kayaking expedition in this area. So presto, you've got something to do uh, on the way. That, provi that 
this particular uh, example was very successful because the lady in question is very entrepreneurial, bought her own kayaks, uh, so be able to, uh, to sell it to uh, other uh, companies as well, which is great because that means the, you know, more people can do this trip and it's only better for, uh, for the economy. It means that we got the kayaks back, uh, our kayaks back, and we proceeded to bring them to Inlay Lake, where we are now in the process of doing a similar type of uh, local community-based uh, project. Here's where you can see the kayaks being moved, actually. Uh, third uh, example, and uh, this uh, takes it one notch up, uh, has to do with community-based tourism, and in particular homestays. Uh, we've been asked to help uh, a, a homestay in the remote uh, western part of Cambodia uh, at the temples of Bante Smart to help them out because they had difficulty filling their homestays, which otherwise are very nice. But we know from out of our experience that getting people to stay in a homestay is getting more and more difficult. People want to have some, uh, some creature comforts, like a, a bathroom and everything. At the time, we had uh, two quite nice uh, safari tents in Cambodia that we are, had actually planned to do other things with, but we um, gave them to the community, donated to the community, uh, gave them training, brought uh, some of the staff to hospitality school in Siem Reap to learn how to cook on Western standards. And now we have uh, a luxury homestay, uh, a luxury tented camp stay provided by uh, the local community who otherwise would only have been able to sell $5 um, uh, homestay overnights and can now do uh, a multiple of that uh, by providing the tented camp overnights. And obviously this is uh, not just only a few people, the whole community uh, are, uh, are invited to join. Uh, frequently we, uh, we arrange, uh, they arrange actually for us uh, um, uh, music uh, or dance performances as well. And the last uh, uh, one I wanted to, uh, and it's actually uh, Xavier, you do, uh, just before the lunch, you did a, a great presentation on how you can do things different as accommodation. And I think uh, we checked off a lot of the boxes without having the benefit of hearing you. But it's quite logical. Um, we uh, built a, um, a lodge, a community lodge in the south of Thailand, uh, right at the back of the, uh, one of uh, the oldest rainforests of Southeast Asia, in Khao Sok National Park. Uh, we built our own, our own lodge because the other lodges locally weren't either not sustainable or not on the level that we needed for our clients. We built our own and we got the community involved straight from the beginning. We hired them for our staff, which is logical, but we didn't import them. We trained them um, and we uh, provide a whole list of uh, activities that can be provided by the local community. Um, for the same reason that Xavier uh, mentioned this morning, you gotta get thing, you gotta get, people are there and they are there for a reason. Um, they are there to explore, but they also don't wanna be hard sold on something. So uh, things like the, uh, the jogging track, we don't have a jogging track, but we do have a free map for uh, a half hour, 40 minutes uh, hike through the jungle that people can do. Obviously we offer more, we also also do uh, canoe trips uh, on the river or lake trips or, or, or half day or full day hikes for which people have to pay. Um, what was interesting I thought about um, uh, yesterday the reception is that uh, travel got combined with art, with uh, that uh, fantastic art uh, uh, show that we got and I feel it's very important to get culture involved. It's actually uh, uh, it's very good to see that GSTC has it, one of their pillars is, uh, is local culture. So we make sure that within uh, uh, the community lodge we actually have an art gallery as part of it and we have an exhibition space and frequently we ask, uh, invite uh, the, uh, the locals from further away to give um, uh, their local art exhibitions like for example here the um, puppet, uh, Shadow Puppet Show. And last, and this uh, uh, hooks into what the WWF is trying to do with their uh, conservation travel. Uh, obviously, Anurag Lodge has a, a great op uh, opportunity to do more in uh, um, nature conservation. So uh, we, uh, together with uh, experts on the, on the subject, we give local uh, community guides uh, the opportunity to learn more about uh, nature and how to express uh, their knowledge, their practical knowledge to, uh, to the travelers. So here you can see one of the, uh, uh, the trainings in process. Um, and that concludes my, uh, my presentation here. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Well, I think that was great, and that gave us lots of very practical examples of how things could be done differently. And I won't. I feel very tempted to start with the questions now, but I won't, because I want to hear first from our next two panelists and to have a, a, a range of viewpoints on, on things to look at, because I imagine there will be some common themes running through. So could we hear next from, uh, I'll try my very best here to pronounce, uh, Hung Seok Pyeong? Close enough. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. While, while you're getting ready for your presentation, go, yeah, please go ahead. Um, you probably heard the noise from the construction happening earlier on. There was some drilling happening. That's, that's finished now. Okay, that's been dealt with. And so thank you very much for your patience. Hey, 안녕하세요. 어, 아마 오늘 처음으로 한국말로 스피커에서 얘기를 들으실 것 같아서 반가워하실 거라고 어, 하셨는데요. 네, 저도 그 이렇게 많은 분들이 이 자리에 오셨을지 잘 몰랐어요. 근데 너무 많은 분들이 오셔서 굉장히 반갑습니다. 에, 제가 한국에서 처음 시작을 좀, 뭐 제가 처음 한건 아니지만 제가 일을 처음 시작했을 때만 해도 파트너라고 할 만한 사람들이 얼마나 있을까 많이 고민이 있었는데 지금은 굉장히 많은 분들이 좀 함께 해주시고 있는 것 같습니다. 제가 GSTC에 한국 정부가 가입을 할때 제가 그 회의 때 코스타리카에 가서 어, 가입하고 했던 거를 좀 같이 했었어요. 환경부랑 같이 가서. 그런 의미에서 굉장히 좀 남다른, 어, 감회가 있는 자리이기도 합니다. 그리고 방금 전에, 어, 연사께서 반띠아이치마를 말씀을 하셨는데, 저희가 여행 상품으로 하고 있는 마을이 그곳이기도 해요. 한국에서. 그래서 저로서는 또 굉장히, 아, 여기서 또 이렇게 만나게 되는구나 하는 반가운 마음을 좀 가집니다. 제가 오늘 드릴, 제가 드릴 이야기는 좀 작은 얘기입니다. 어, 작은 얘기고, 한국에서의 사례들 얘기고요. 어떻게 보면 현업에서 공정, 어, 저희로서 이제 공정여행 조금 이따 말씀드리겠지만, 공정여행이라는 표현으로 하고 있는데, 리스폰서블 트래블이나 아니면 서스테이너블 트래블을 하고 있는 것을 시장에서 대체 어떻게 아, 정말로 마케팅 해야 되느냐는 저희 현업에서의 고민들을 가지고 말씀을 좀 드리도록 하겠습니다. 어, 저희 회사는 이제 트래블러스 맵이라는 회사예요. 트래블러스 맵이라는 거는 트래블러스 메이크 어메이징 플래닛 이것을 좀 줄여가지고 트래블러스 맵이라는 회사를 만들었습니다. 2009년에 어, 설립을 했고요. 어, 한국에서는, 한국에서는 조금 독특하게 사회적 기업의 아, 정부 인증 제도가 있어요. 그래서 저희가 한국에서는 첫 번째로 사회적 기업으로 인증을 받은 이제 회사이기도 합니다. 그리고 지금까지 국내에서는 한 150개 정도, 해외에서는 한 100여 개 정도의 상품들을 개발해서 어, 판매를 하고 있고요. 어, 맵 캄보디아, 맵 네팔 이런 어, 현재 좀 파트너 회사들을 아시아권에서 좀 만들어 가는 노력들을 좀 함께 어, 해 오고 있습니다. 어, 한국 상황을 먼저 조금 말씀을 좀 드리는 게 좋을 것 같아요. 왜냐하면은. 한국에서 생태관광이라는 걸로 많은 분들이 어, 생태관광 활동에 참여도 하고 계시는데 여기가 그 중에서도 가장 유명한 그러니까 전 세계적으로도 유명한 철새 도래지이기도 한 순천만이라는 곳입니다. 순천만의 연간 방문객들이 한 200만 명 정도가 갑니다. 제가 이곳에 생태관광 모니터링을 좀 하면서 지역의 마을을 좀 갔던 적이 있었어요. 여기가 어디냐면 이제 생태 순천만 생태 공원입니다. 사람들이 어디를 가냐면 저기 이제 회색 부분으로 돼 있는 곳, 저쪽이 주차장 지역에 사람들이 저 입구로 다 통해서 저곳에 200만 명이 반복을 합니다. 그리고 그 바로 옆에는요 대대 마을이라는 마을이 하나가 있어요. 제가 저 마을에를 갔어요. 200만 명이 방문하는 관광지에 있는 마을은 어떻게 살아가고 계실까? 어떤 혜택들을 보고 계실까? 어, 그래서 주민들을 만나서 인터뷰를 했는데, 죄송합니다. 이 부분은 이제 제가 번역을 하기가 좀 어려워서 우리 동식 통역사분들께 좀 부탁을 좀 드리겠습니다. 이분들한테 물었더니, 이분들 말씀이 주말이면 관광객들 때문에 어, 이 마을 분들은 오히려 밖에도 못 나가시는 상황이 됩니다. 그리고 이렇게 나이 많으신 분들은 버스 타고 많이 다니시는데, 버스마저도 젊은 친구들이 다 자리를 메우고 다녀서 어르신들은 아예 주말에 움직이지도 못하시고요. 이분들이 불쑥불쑥 마을에 문을 열고 들어와가지고 뭐 음식물을 뭘 팔아라, 화장실 좀쓸수 없냐. 그래서 굉장히 어, 여기 원래 저희 한국에는 시골에서 자물쇠 잠그고 살지 않는데, 자물쇠라도 달아야 되나 이런 고민까지를 막 하고 계시는 상황이었습니다. 그래서 제가 이렇게 물어봤어요. 관광지가 되고 나서 주민들 중에 도움이 된 분들은 얼마나 있으신가요? 이렇게 물었더니 
한 스무 명 정도에 한 분쯤 있을까 말까 라고 얘기를 하시더라고요 200만 명이 오는 생태관광지에 그 바로 앞에 살고 있는 마을 분조차도 스무 명 중에 한명 정도만 경제적인 혜택을 입고 있다면 이 생태관광은 무엇인가 하는 근본적인 고민들이 좀 들었던 때였었습니다 어 그런 질문들을 가지고 한국에서도 어, 새로운 종류의 어, 관광 혹은 여행 문화들을 좀 만들기 위해서 여러 시도들이 있어 왔습니다 생태관광이라는 거는 1990년대부터 한국에서도 어, 회자되었던 말인데요 이게 조금 본격적으로 사람들한테 아 뭔가 다른 여행이란 것이 들여오기 시작된 거는 어, 한국에서는 공정여행, 페어 트래블이라는 형태로 좀 소개가 됐습니다. 그런데 그 안에 담고 있는 내용은 리스폰서블 트래블이라고 표현을 하든 서스테이너블 트래블이라고 표현을 하든 같은 내용이라고 사실은 좀 생각하셔도 됩니다. 어, 그리고 2009년쯤에요. 어, 이런 것들을 비즈니스화 하기 위한 여러 종류의 기업들이 동시적으로 여러 기업들이 이제 만들어지기 시작합니다. 그래서 2010년 정도에는 이분들과 함께 비즈니스적으로 이 문제들을 풀어갈, 물론 이제 생태관광협회 같은 것도 있기도 하지만 기업들이 중심이 돼서 이걸 어떻게 비즈니스로 풀어갈 거냐를 가지고서 모인, 어, 줄여서 이제 카스트라는 조직을 저희가 만들었고, 현재는 한 30개 회사 정도가 있고요. 저희가 한국에서 이와 유사한 활동들을 하고 있는 플레이어들이 얼마나 될까를 쭉 계산을 해봤 한 200개 정도의 기업들 혹은 조직들이 지금 현재 활동을 하고 계십니다 그러니까 굉장히 빠른 시간 안에 굉장히 빠르게 많은 플레이어들이 등장하고 있는 상황인 것 같습니다 그리고 한국 사람들의 인식들도 굉장히 많이 달라져서요 이거는 2014년에 관광공사에서 발표했던 KTO가 그 한국관광공사인데요 한국관광공사에서 발표했던 자료를 보면 어 여러 테마들 중에 다음 여행에서 해외여행을 간다면 어떤 테마의 여행을 가고 싶냐라고 했을 때 재미있게도 저희가 말씀드렸던 공정여행 혹은 착한 여행이라고 표현한 그런 것들을 난 가보고 싶다가 세 번째 순위로 올라갈 정도로 관심들도 굉장히 어, 많아지고 있습니다 그래서 저희 회사도 그런 방식으로 해서 현재 어, 마케팅들을 이분들을 대상으로 어, 이제 인식이 이 정도가 개선이 됐으니 어, 우리 열심히 좀 일을 해보자 이런 걸 가지고서 여러 마케팅 활동들을 하는데요 아 이것들이 참 쉽지를 않습니다. 어 저희 회사의 이제 여행 상품으로는 한 100여 개 이상의 상품들과 방문자로 보면 한 2만 명 정도의 방문자들이 오고 계세요. 홈페이지를 주요한 저희 채널로 이용을 하고 있죠. 그 다음에 이 카카오톡이나 인스타그램 뭐그 다음에 한 장이 더 넘어갔네요. 어 페이스북 페이지 등과 같은 카카오톡은 외국분들은 잘 모르시겠지만 한국에서는 전 국민이 사용하는 일종의 인스턴트 메시저, 메신저 같은 겁니다. 페이스북 페이지 등등을 이용해서 한국에서는 굉장히 재빠르게 일종의 디지털 마케팅들을 채널로서 활용하면서 어, 하고 있습니다. 물론 이것의 효용성이 얼마나 있는지에 대해서는 여러 질문과 고민들이 있지만 이런 채널들을 특히 소자본의 작은 플레이어들은 활용함으로써 어떤 성과들을 어, 내려는 노력들을 하고 있습니다. 그리고 저희 그 여행 상품을 그러면 여행 상품이라는 것의 가치는 어떻게 전달되느냐라고 봤더니 물론 홈페이지를 통해서 상품을 소개하는 것들도 있지만 여전히 한국 사람들 중에 거의 한 60% 이상의 사람들은 블로그에서 블로그에 있는 정보들에 대해서 여행과 관련해 첫 번째로 신뢰한다라는 조사들을 좀 보여주고 계세요. 어, 이건 왜 그럴까? 제가 지금 이제 한국에서는 어떤 일들이 좀 있냐면 블로그 자체가 굉장히 상업화되어서 어, 원래 어, 그 상품의 가치보다 훨씬 광고의 성격이 강한 어, 그런 이제 블로그들이 많아서 신뢰도가 많이 떨어지고 있기도 하나 여전히 어떤 종류의 아주 디테일한 텍스트들에 대해서 신뢰하고 그 텍스트를 보고 상품을 선택하려고 하는 경향들이 좀 있으셨던 것 같습니다 그리고 최근에는 저희가 어떤 시도도 하냐면 그러니까 정말 할수 있는 채널들은 다 가동해 보려고 하는 건데요 예를 들어서 외국 경우는 어떨지 모르겠지만 한국에서는 홈쇼핑이 대단히 중요한 여행 상품의 판매 채널 중에 하나입니다 그래서 최근에 한국에서 가장 큰 홈쇼핑 회사인 GS홈쇼핑 이라는 곳하고 한국의 공정여행 어, 리스폰서블 트래블 상품들을 한세 번에 걸쳐서 판매를 했어요. 근데 저희도 굉장히 놀랐던 게 어, 한국 여행 상품을 한국 사람들이 특히 한국 
결국은 워낙 저가 시장들이 발달해 있어서 20만 원 정도 하는 국내 여행 상품을 홈쇼핑이라고 살까라는 고민들을 막 했었는데요. 굉장히 놀랍게도 새벽 6시쯤 일요일 날 아침 6시에 했던 방송임에도 불구하고 한 1,800명 정도의 저희가 한 300명 모아야 되는데 1,800명 정도의 고객들이 반응하시는 걸 보면서 아 어떤 의미에서는 조금 어, 새로운 가능성들이 좀 한국에서 보이고 있는 게 아닌가 이런 좀 짐작들을 합니다. 2만 원, 3만 원짜리 투어 프로그램을 구매하시던 분들이 아니라 이제는 국내를 가더라도 한 20만 원 이상의 어, 비용을 지출하면서 가려는 고객층들이 말하자면 프리미엄 퀄리티의 어떤 상품들에 대한 수요들이 있다는 것을 좀 저희로서도 다시 좀 확인한 어, 계기였었습니다. 그리고 저희들이 활용할 수 있는 다른 것들은 어, 자본이 없이 할수 있는 것들은 특별한 독특한 그 컨텐츠나 아니면 컨셉들을 가지고서 어, 언론을 통해서 홍보를 하는 장면들인데요. 이거는 어, 보르네오에 오랑우탄을 좀 구조해서 오랑우탄을 케어하는 것을 로치 형태로 숙소 형태로 운영하고 있는 곳이 있는데요. 거기를 좀 저희가 여행 상품으로 같이 개발을 해서 어, 신문 기자랑 함께 동행을 해서 취재를 했던 장면들입니다. 이런 방식으로 막 상품들을 어, 마케팅 채널을 통해서 어, 하고 있는데 그 내용들은 그러면 그 안에 담긴 내용들은 뭐냐 뭘 갖고 그러면 그런 마케팅 요소들로 좀 잡고 있냐를 보면 그 중에 한 케이스로 국내에 어, 청산도라는 슬로우 시티로 지정된 곳 중에 하나입니다. 청산도라는 섬 여행을 잠깐 좀 보여드리려고 하는데요. 어, 청산도 감성 여행 이런 형태의 이제 컨셉들을 잡죠. 컨셉들을 잡고 그 다음에 청산도에 있는 아름다운 자연 청산도 가보신 분들은 알겠지만 정말 아름다운 자연자원들을 가지고 있습니다. 그 자연자원들을 부각시키는 거. 그 다음에 현지에 있는 로컬 가이드들인데요. 이분은 목사님이신데 현지에서 20년 정도 사시면서 청산도를 사진으로 담아왔던 분인데 그러다 보니까 청산도 주민들보다도 훨씬 청산도의 문화에 대한 해박한 지식들을 가지고 계세요. 청산도에 굉장히 독특한 문화 중에 하나가 뭐가 있냐면 풍장이라는 게 있어요. 이걸 어떻게 번역을 해서 말씀드려야 될지 모르겠지만 시신을 매장하는 게 아니라 매장하는 게 아니라 그냥 흙 위에다가 시신을 놓고 그 위에 집단 같은 거를 덮고 한 1년 정도가 지난 뒤에 매장을 하는 그런 풍속이 있습니다. 이게 섬 지역 경우에 이런 풍장이라는 게 많이 발달해 있는데요. 현재도 어떤 어떤 지역에 가면 그런 장례를 볼수 있는 곳들이 있어요. 이런 분들은 그런 포인트들을 알고 계시는 거죠. 그래서 현지의 로컬 가이드들하고 이런 상품들을 운영을 하고요. 그 다음에 이곳은 슬로우 시티로 지정이 됐고 슬로우 시티로 지정이 되기 위한 여러 조건 으로서 농업과 같은 그리고 이 시골 마을 전원 마을이 가지고 있는 여러 풍경들을 가지고 있는 것을 또 하나의 컨셉으로 가지고요. 그 다음에 당연하게도 현지에서 나오는 로컬 푸드들 현지의 재료와 현지의 독특 한 음식들을 소재로 한 것들을 직접 거기에 주민들이 만들어 주시는 음식들을 먹고 오게 되죠. 그리고 여러 종류의 좀 쉼이 있는 감성 여행 이런 컨셉이니까 쉼이 있는 느린 액티비티들 걷기라던가 아니면 아까 피크닉 얘기하셨었는데 바닷가에서 피크닉용 물품들 가져가 가지고 같이 점심을 같이 먹는 그런 것들을 이제 프로그램으로 만들어서 하고 있습니다. 여기서부터가 이제 제 고민인데요. 어, 가장 큰 고민인데요. <웃음> 저희 고객들을 보니까 30대부터 50대까지의 여성들이 가장 많습니다. 아마도 이, 이 그룹이 전 세계적으로도 가장 강력한 구매력을 가진 집단으로 보이고요. 윤리적 소비자라는 분들도 대부분 이 라인들 안에 있습니다. 그래서 저희 손님들은 그러면 어떤 의미에서는 전체적인 맥락에서 보면 어, 에티컬 컨슈머라는 맥락에서 충분히 이해될 수 있겠다. 그리고 그렇게 연관되어서 보여지는 것들이 한 50만 명 정도의 다른 이제 유럽 사회하고 비교하면 아직은 사이즈가 작지만 50만 명 정도 그러니까 전 국민의 한 1% 정도가 어, 생활 소비자 생활협동조합의 조합원으로 있으셔요. 이 50만이라는 고객은 굉장히 큰 어, 규모의 사실은 어, 우호적 고객일 수 있는 분들인 거죠. 근데 문제는 아직도요. 이분들이 구매하는 것들은 안전한 먹거리 어, 농약을 치지 않고 유기농으로 재배한 안전한 먹거리 정도에 있습니다. 그러면 이분들이 관광이라는 것에 대해서는 어떻게 생각하느냐 어, 제가 외국에 갔을 때 특히 유럽 사회에서 가장 어, 다르게 느꼈던 결정적인 차이들이 숙소를 선택함에 있어서의 그 호텔에 
사회적 책임에 대한 질문들을 하시는 걸 보고 굉장히 많이 놀랐어요 작은 홈페이지에도 CSR 코너들이 있어서 우리가 어떤 종류의 CSR을 하고 있다는 걸 표현하고 있는 것이 굉장히 놀라웠는데 사실은 한국에서는 아무도 그런 질문을 아직 하지 않습니다 그러니까 지금까지 작은 의미에서의 먹거리와 관련된 윤리적 소비는 벌어지고 있지만 그것을 조금 넘어선 윤리적 소비들은 아직 이루어지지 않는 것 같습니다 그러면 이런 인식들을 어떻게 바꾸어 갈 거냐 이런 것들이 중요한 이제 과제이기도 하고요 그 다음에 시골에 보면 저희도 이제 어뭐 이걸 외국 표현으로 하면 루럴 투어리즘 이렇게 부르는 농촌 마을들이 많이 개발된 곳들이 있습니다 약천개 정도가 있고요 이천 개에다가 정부는 약 10조 원 이상의 돈을 이미 어 부어서 어 어떻게 보면 관광 개발을 해왔습니다 그런데 현재 그 중에서 어 지속성을 가지고 운영되는 곳 정부 지원금이 끊기고 나서도 지속성을 가지고 운영되는 곳들은 몇 개나 될까요? 라는 거에 전국에 계시는 이 체험마을 관계자들도 스무 개를 넘기가 어려울 거다라고 보고 있습니다 그러니까 마을들을 지원을 했고 개발은 했지만 그것에 지속 가능한 모델을 만드는 데는 또 여전히 실패를 한 겁니다 그리고 어 우리가 이제 공정 어 이런 이제 리스폰서블 내지는 서스테이너블 투어리즘을 하게 되면 굉장히 어, 특별한 컨셉들이나 주제들을 가지고 상품들을 만들어 봅니다 저희도 어떤 걸 만들어 보냐면 공정무역 산지를 방문하는 투어라던가 뭐 아니면은 이제 뭐 독일에서의 뭐 맥주를 마시면서 어, 다니는 투어라던가 이런 식의 아니면 앙코르와 유적을 마라톤으로 이렇게 뛰는 행사들을 매년 겨울에 하는데요 그런 투어들을 만들었을 땐 어, 이런 건 정말 잘 팔릴 것 같다고 라 했지만 사실은 그런 것에 반응하는 수는 아주 미미한 수 더라라는 걸좀 보고 있습니다. 그러면서 이제 저희가 그 저희 고객들의 여러 반응들을 놓고 봤을 때는 아 이게 뭔가 우리가 어, 옳은 일, 착한 일을 하고 있어요로 어필하는 문제가 아니라 어, 어떻게 보면 새로운 트렌드, 관광업의 새로운 트렌드가 바뀌어 가고 있고 그래서 우리가 청산도 아까 케이스에서 보신 것처럼 청산도에서 하는 경험이 어렵고 불편하거나 아니면 굉장히 낯설지만 우리가 해야 되는 것이 아니라 그것 자체로 이미 사람들이 굉장히 즐겁고 행복하게 경험을 할수 있는 새로운 여행이다라는 제안들을 해야 되는 게 아닌가 그래서 어떤 의미에서는 우리를 페어 트래블, 리스폰서블 트래블이라고 했던 것에서 이제는 다음 세대의 여행은 이런 여행이에요 그리고 이게 진짜 여러분들이 하셔야 될 여행입니다 를 강조 하면서 가야 되는 게 아닐까 이런 좀 고민들을 좀 하고 있습니다. 그런 거에서 한국에 있는 두개 정도의 플랫폼들을 어, 설명을 드리고 좀 마칠까 하는데요. 어떤 플랫폼들이 좀 한국에서 등장하고 있냐면 이건 이제 소셜 벤처라고 부르는 이제 저희로서는 친구들이 만들고 있는 건데 이건 프립이라는 곳입니다. 프렌트립인데 줄여 가지고 지금은 프립 이렇게 하고 있어요. 여기는 뭐냐면 액티비티들만을 모아 놓은 플랫폼이에요. 예를 들어 뭐 뛴다던가 동네에서 걷는다던가 뭐 아니면 어디 가서 카약을 탄다던가 하는 그런 거를 누군가 올려놓고 그걸 하고 싶은 사람들이 같이 모여서 놀게 되는 거죠 근데 잘 아시다시피 사실은 이런 종류의 아웃도어 액티비티들은 어, 이 서스테이너블 투어리즘에서 굉장히 중요한 트렌드 중에 하나라고 봅니다 따라서 이들이 하고 있는 것이 어, 특별한 사회적 가치를 현재로서 만들어내고 있느냐에 대해서는 고민이 있지만 이런 종류의 플랫폼에 젊은 친구들이 반응하고 열광하고 있다라는 건 새로운 종류의 좀 어, 현상이 아닐까 이렇게 좀 보고요. 두 번째로는 어, 가이드들을 연결한 플랫폼인데요. 그래서 전 세계에 있는 주로는 조금 한국인들이 많이 가이드를 하고 있는데. 전 세계에서 가이드를 하는 분들이 자기의 어, 주로 이제 원데이 투어 정도의 가이드 상품들을 올려놓고 그것을 현지에서 결합해서 운영하는 방식의 어, 트립들을 진행을 하고 있습니다. 여기도 이름을 달고 있는 건 예를 들어 에어비앤비가 하고 있는 캐치프레이드처럼 캐치프레이드 같은 것처럼 현지 여행의 모든 것, 마이 리얼 트립, 나의 진짜 여행 이런 것들을 자기 컨셉으로 가지고 있는데요. 여기에도 굉장히 어, 빠른 속도로 사람들이 플랫폼들을 이용하면서 어, 활동. 들을 좀 하고 있습니다. 이런 점들에서 보면 아직은 좀 어렵고 힘들기는 하지만 새로운 트렌드나 새로운 흐름들에 대해서 그것을 꼭 서스테이너블 투어리즘이라고 표현하지 않더라도 충분히 큰 트렌드들이 한국 사회에는 형성돼 가고 있다. 다만 그걸 어떤 방식으로 어떻게 접근할 거냐에 대해서는 저 역시도 저희 회사도 어, 많은 고민을 좀 해야겠다 이런 데 생각을 하고 있습니다. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you. That was. That was really useful, and, and I think that it's great to have a, a different perspective on this. Sometimes there is the assumption that the things that are done abroad are better, and there's clear evidence here that actually that's not the case. There's a lot of things happening in Korea that the rest of the world 
can, can very evidently learn from. We'll move to our third speaker. We've got Jen, so you've got about 10 minutes, and then uh, that gives us some time for questions and answers afterwards. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to uh, join this conference here. Thank you, GSTC and Randy. Um, I'm impressed by, by the audience. I think it's been some great content, uh, as Willem said. So wanted to kind of introduce a little bit what we're doing at Mekong Tourism. Um, very quickly, I work for uh, Mekong Tourism my own company, Chameleon Strategies, is an affiliate member with UNWTO. Um, I used to be in China for some time where we started a digital social media agency for travel and tourism and also was chair for Pata China and before that headed marketing uh, strategy for Fairmont Hotels and, and uh, Canadian Tourism. When it comes to the Mekong River, um, about uh, Ten years ago, the Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office was established to, uh, with a mandate to promote uh, travel and tourism as a single uh, destination in Cambodia, China, uh, that's the provinces of Guangxi and Yunnan, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. So we're based in, in Bangkok, and we're getting collaboration and funding from the six countries with support from the Asian Development Bank. Uh, last year, we launched the Experience Mekong Marketing Strategy, which can be downloaded on our website, uh, to really uh, put a roadmap out there how we should market uh, the, the region. And currently, we're putting together the next 10-year tourism sector strategy, um, as a lot of things have changed over the last 10 years, from air access uh, to uh, uh, border facilitation, um, and, and a lot of other things also as it relates to infrastructure and, and countries like Myanmar that are now, now accessible for tourism. Um, now, one thing that I think is unique for the region is that the experiences that are to be had are very unique. And uh, if it is nature-based or if it's connecting with people, um, the food and so on, really create a unique um, uh, experience and critic uh, moments that, that turn into memories. As, as Willem mentioned, I think there's a lot of great product now available. When we look at it, is how can we promote um, these products and these experiences? And we say it, it's through storytelling. Um, so on one hand, we have a lot of storytellers already. Um, if it's travelers that share content on social media, um, but also we have travel writers and bloggers, and they kind of share their experiences that come alive. On the other hand, we have channels, and these channels can be very different based on the source market, based on the niche, the target market. But in the end, that whole framework, in essence, creates an opportunity to tell these stories. You know, Willem, Willem kind of uh, put a few examples out there, but. I'm sure many of you haven't heard about these experiences. They are there, but they're sometimes hidden. Now, that could be a good thing as well, but when it comes to promoting, storytelling can bring these experiences alive. So we built a little bit of a framework how we want to do that. On one hand, we have the industry, and on the website, we have ways for um, the industry to share uh, documents, articles, and so on. And we want to be that hub when it comes to the Mekong region. Um, on the other hand, we have travelers that obviously can share their, their, their experiences, but we also have residents um, that live in the region that have very um, interesting stories to tell as well. So that's kind of our framework. We have built a powerful digital platform um, that really houses and enables us to execute um, this strategy. Um, we won a couple of awards, but for the last two years we built this platform and now we're in a very exciting time to execute these programs. So what I'm looking to do today is uh, introduce to you our core projects. Um, and all these projects are based on partnerships. Because in the end, you know, when you, when you look at our name, the Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office, we are there so to facilitate. 
We don't really create the content, but we're looking to bring the public and the private sector together, from industry, residents, uh, experiences, and the travelers. And the good thing is, even though we have very limited resources, we have one thing, and that's the passion and the expertise for the region. Anyone you talk to who has traveled in the region or works in the region, they all have a true passion, and they want to share that passion and help uh, when it comes to sustainability. So our four programs you know, are a contributor program, uh, a stories program, uh, a responsible tourism guide, and a Mekong Moments campaign. So very quickly, I want to dive into these programs. The first one is our Mekong Tourism Contributor Program, which have, we have divided into two pieces. One is our Mekong Tourism Experts community that we're looking to develop with people from the industry. This could be CEOs, could be consultants, could be uh, uh, bloggers, anyone who is working in the industry and has something to share. And on the other hand, we create a community on storytellers. These could be travelers, bloggers, anyone who wants to share their travel experiences. Here are a few, they get a page, we see Willem is on there, we got bloggers, we got various contributors, and um, they're getting more and more active, we get quite a lot of content on there. And, and that's very important because in the end, we don't want to kind of just publish press releases, or we also don't have the resources to kind of create our own uh, content. As I said, the passion and the expertise is there. The question is how to unleash that. Um, here's just one example of a, of a story, um, and, and it's also then featured on the home page. We also have a section called Multi-Country Journeys. Um, we're launching other ones on causes and river cruising. Um, here's one example of um, a epic 40-day five-country tour in the Mekong region provided by Kiri Travel, and we asked them to kind of put that together in storytelling format, which we then put on the website and links to. So tour operators like that because in the end, indirectly it drives business as well. The other piece is our online library, which has been very effective and very popular because there's a lot of documents out there for master plans, training documents, et cetera, et cetera, but many times they're lost. People don't know where they are. So now we have over 500 documents on, on the platform that are available for free download, relevant as it relates to the GMS, the Greater Mekong Subregion, and travel and tourism. The second program is um, something that we're recreating right now, and it's the Mekong Responsible Tourism Guide. Um, and responsible tourism, obviously I'm preaching to the choir here, is more relevant than ever. But in 2007, about 10 years ago, and some of you may remember this, this booklet, uh, there was a, um, a responsible tourism guide produced uh, with some funding um, from ADB and other ones, um, but it only uh, included Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam as a print booklet. Uh, but it won quite a few awards and was very relevant at that time. 10 years ago, uh, time flies. Five years later, um, this project was put online and there was a web website launch that also included all the countries. Nowadays, uh, today, this, this website is still there, but it's not updated anymore. Um, and so, again, we need to kind of look at the content, we need to make it more user-friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So, 2017, we're looking to relaunch uh, this Mekong Responsible Tourism Guide and integrate it into our digital platform. You know, so this is something that we're very actively working on and already have built an advisory board. Some of you in the room are part of this advisory board and supporting this initiative. Um, the next one is a very interesting and exciting initiative and it's called the Mekong Tourism Stories Program. Um, some of you may have heard about a project that has been done by UNWTO called the Tourism Stories. Um, three books have been published so far, the last one on the Philippines after the hurricane. And when that was launched at the last ASEAN Tourism Forum, I went to UNWTO and I said, the next, the fourth book we would like to do about the Greater Mekong sub-region. So we just signed the agreement and we're looking to now curate these impact stories, human impact stories of people that live in the Mekong region and through tourism have gotten out of poverty. And that we want to also bring alive. So we're working with, with uh, someone from CNN and Nick Ray, who uh, wrote a lot of the Lonely Planet uh, books in, in the region, to really bring these, these stories alive also via video. 
And so that's a very exciting uh, project. And we just uh, announced as well at the last World Tourism Day uh, with some of the leaders of the countries. You see Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and, and, and Thailand, and UNWTO, all um, the, the governments supporting this initiative. The last one is a very exciting initiative, um, and it's called our Mekong Moments Campaign. Now, a lot of people have done social media campaigns, and I'm sure many of you have done your own social media campaigns, some successful, some less successful, some more successful. Um, but how we're looking to do it differently is really developing this social media campaign as a turnkey solution so anybody in the Mekong region, if it's a small souvenir shop, a silk weaver, to a DMC, a big hotel, an airline, can participate and create their own campaign within that platform. And so under that Mekong Moments hashtag, anybody create their own campaign. So it could be someone like Kiri that builds maybe a little trip and asks people to share their experiences, and, um, but build it through their own platform and then gives out prizes. It could be a little homestay that ha has their own campaign, an airline. So we talk from IHG to Air Asia, Bangkok Airways, down to smaller resorts that can all be part of this. Um, we're creating flyers that can be customized. Uh, this was actually done by, by Kiri. And then we're, uh, the, the businesses itself will promote it directly to the consumers. Uh, um, we are in the process of building a whole um, campaign platform for that where the content gets aggregated. So when you get to the home page, you see all these various images. And what's exciting is then you can click on an image and you see the business. So the business actually gets a listing as well and it also drives business right into that. And all these businesses are also then tagged on a map. You know? So we're looking to create a whole new travel exploration website based on this campaign through crowdfunding where people share these experiences. Um, what's exciting about it also is that we create a little video um, and I'm very excited to say that you're the first people now in this room to see actually that video and we have a few videos. We have our general video but what I decided today is not to show you our general video for the campaign but one we've created was one of the uh, um, resorts that we're working with, and the general manager is actually in the room. It's in uh, northern Laos, the Namkat, uh, Yolapa, and we created a video for them so we can create videos for anybody, uh, if it's a small or a large company, to then promote the campaign to their, um, to their, to their guests and stakeholders and customers. If we can get the uh, volume up, and then if... Maybe they can help me click on the video. So thank you very much, very excited for that. So we <laughs> basically looking to make a social media campaign into a capacity building exercise. So anyone, we saw an image earlier, I think from Randy, anyone can fly. Now we say anyone can have their social media campaign in the Mekong region. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oops. Okay, that was, that was fantastic, wasn't it? And so many times you kind of think, oh, you know, sustainable tourism, boring, slow. Actually, you made that look really fun. Yeah. Um, so let's just kind of, um, you know, in the same way that earlier on I tried to um, push a little bit the other panelists. I'm, I'm afraid it's your turn now. Um, does sustainable tourism in niche markets make any money? Because that's the first question we're going to be asked. You guys are doing an awful lot of work, and some of the people here will say, you know what, 
with half the work, by putting many more people on the same bus, we can make more money. Willem. Um, yes, it does. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, I like hobbies. I like expensive hobbies, but uh, for work, it needs to make money. Um, yeah, so it does, absolutely. Um, um, I think uh, there, there's always uh, advantage in volume. Um, so more people, uh, more money, but um, you know, you, to have 100 times $1, you could also have 10 times $10. And the 10 times $10 is much easier to curate and to manage than 100 times $1. Okay, so your tours are more expensive than a vanilla flavored tour, but what you're saying is customers actually recognize the difference and they're willing to pay for it. Absolutely. Exactly. That is completely true. Um, though we have also experiences that cost very little to nothing. Uh, we, uh, as, as with uh, the Lodge in the South, we are aware that we also uh, things sometimes have to cost nothing or are, are, are cheaper to do um, uh, locally. So, for example, in Bangkok, you can do um, uh, a tour of the town by using the public transport. And we do that, uh, so we don't have a, a minibus on the streets, which typically on, uh, on, an, uh, on a tour is one of the most expensive ingredients. So yeah, you don't have to, uh, it doesn't have to be more expensive. But by the fact that you do it for less people, does make it uh, a little bit more expensive, usually, than a mass-produced tour. Okay. How about applying this to South Korea? So, Hung Seok, um, are we saying that in South Korea, there is a market that is also recognizing the value of the individualized tour, the being a person and not just somebody in a crowd. You, you need to press the microphone. <웃음> 네, 아직 그게 대중화돼 있다고 보기는 조금 어려운 것 같습니다. 그런데 어, 갈수록 좀 이제 패키지 투어 형태, 특히 이제 한국에서는 한 40명 정도가 같이 다니는. 아마 외국에서 많이 보셨을 텐데 그런 방식의 투어들이 아직까지도 주류를 좀 차지하고 있어요. 근데 어, 특히 좀 젊은 친구들 그 다음에 한 30대 40대 정도의 그룹에서는 그런 종류의 투어에 좀 지치고 새로운 경험들을 하고 싶다는 욕구들이 굉장히 강해지고 있습니다. 제가 아까 마지막에 어, 보여드렸던 플랫폼들이 그런 욕구들을 충족시켜 주기 때문에 현재 막 확장되고 있다고 보여져요. 그래서 저희는 지금도 그런 방식으로 하고 있습니다. 예를 들어 한두 명 정도가 자기 방식으로 여행할 수 있는 걸 어, 서포트하는 형태의 여행들을 만들어 가고 있는데 이것이 아주 큰 시장으로 현재 만들어 가고 있지는 않지만 조만간 사람들은 그런 여행을 선택하러 움직일 거다라고 저는 우리 고객들의 반응을 봤을 때는 좀 확신을 하고 있는 것 같습니다. Great. And I absolutely love the name of your company because I think sometimes we see companies that try to promote themselves with the big sustainable responsible tourism words. And and I think yours make an amazing planet is a very positive message. Yes, we also use the same language as the same language as the same language as the same language. 공정 여행 혹은 책임 이런 식으로 조금 무겁게 다가가서는 사실은 상품이라고 했을 때는 접근하기가 어렵겠다 이런 생각을 좀 했습니다. 그래서 이걸 최대한 긍정적인 밝은 조금 가벼운 이미지로 만들어낼 수 있는 이름이 뭘까 해서 좀이 이름들을 좀 만들게 됐던 것 같습니다. Okay, and talking about light, touch and positive, uh, Jen, your storytelling is, is great. And that, that was one of the things that written about you know, to talk about later on, and then your presentation came up, and I thought, okay, you've done, you've done the job for me. So, how, how does your organization work? Because clearly I can imagine how Willem, for example, will say, look, I've got a private company, but where do you get your funding from? Is it from government or from your members? Uh, thank you. I mean, we, we are a, basically a governmental organization, so we get our funding from the six countries. Okay. Um, now the funding is not huge, so it, it really covers our operations um, and so on. In order to really execute programs, we are reliant on the private and the public sector to make it work. So, as I said before, the opportunity in the region is to really unleash that passion that exists and that expertise that exists. 
and create almost an open source platform for tourism. I mean, I, I used to work for the Canadian Tourism Co Commission and, and other tourist boards and done a lot of consulting for tourist boards. And as you know, normally it's a very closed system, you know, when it comes to tourism. So what we're looking to do is really, um, really innovate or re-innovate the way how DMOs can operate uh, in a very open source environment. Um, if you have a membership structure as many city DMOs, it becomes very harder because you have to cater to the needs of these members and, and sometimes it gets very political. For us, it's really whoever has a passion to collaborate with us, and I'll, I'll point out Willem here as well because he's been a huge supporter in terms of what we do, but that's what we need, people that believe in us um, and support us uh, doing projects. Also some of the um, development organizations, Swiss Contact is in the room, and other ones um, have supported us, and I think that's very important. We also do a lot of stuff, obviously, online with storytelling, but it's not just online. We have our Mekong Tourism Forum, and again, we also transform that into an open source platform yeah. um, where we have various organizations that come, come on and they build the content, and that is, is actually a very exciting um, uh, initiative or way of doing business, and that's throughout our strategy. But what I find is that the work you're doing is much more exciting than the work done by the National Tourist Boards and each one of your members, if you allow me to say that. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make the comment, you know, because I've seen the work done in some of your countries, and I'm not going to mention any one of them, but actually what you're doing is much more relevant to the, to the millennials and, and, and by extension to many or anybody who's really alive on social media today will be much more turned on by the way that you're doing your storytelling than by some of the very uh, kind of messages that we're seeing that you know belong to the past that we've seen in some of the other tourist boards. I, I think my, my comment would be, I mean, on one hand, if your resources are limited, sometimes you get more creative, number one. Number two, if you work in a true government environment, like the ministries that, that own uh, Mekong Tourism Coordinating Office, um, it gets sometimes very political how you operate. Now having said that, all the work we do is done by the ministries. So if you say we're doing more innovative work than the ministries because we're owned by the ministries, so the ministries are doing innovative work. But I think this is the beauty for all three of you, isn't it? In a way, you've got the flexibility to do things that larger players don't. You know, when in the past when I've spoken to Jane Ashton and other people like her at TUI, um, what they say is obviously, you know, uh, TUI has 20,000 suppliers across the world. For them to actually apply something across the supply chain is an, an enormous task. Whereas, you know, Willem, if you want to talk to your suppliers and say, hey, here's a new initiative, you probably don't need the same level of management and measurement systems and you can just get on with things and talk to people as people. Um, yeah, that's true, uh, on a certain level. Uh, however, um, uh, we also have to deal with a lot of suppliers. Um, our business, uh, in particular the travel business, the incoming business, um, deals with um, a variety of people, and you saw in the, uh, in the presentation I gave, from um, uh, people that provide picnics, local people that provide picnics or uh, community guides to transport uh, uh, organizers. So, um, the, um, as I'd like to say, the, um, um, for, for large tour operators, say for example with TUI, um, it is, it is not, n nothing is easy, but it is fairly easy to say, well, you know, we are going to do this and this, implement this, because it needs to be implemented on the ground and we need to be the, the ones that implement it. Um, so, uh, and um, as Jane Eston has in her presentation as well, um, is they are uh, a, an easy target for customers, because they're very visible and, and they're uh, stock, stock market listed, but they don't have to be. Uh, to be very visible for your customers, so the customer and also NGOs and activists typically uh, target uh, companies uh, in, in, in their home country uh, and then uh, to get things done, uh, we need to do that. And to actually get things done 
on the ground, in particular in Asia, in a difficult uh, environment where there are uh, very little regulations, it's, it's also very hard work. Yeah. So I'm just saying like the whole sustainability chain is, is a lot of work on and, and we all uh, face different challenges, let's put it like that. And, and actually one thing that all three, of all three of you talked about was the need to work in partnership with your suppliers and a lot of your time is in helping your suppliers in product development. So let's talk about health and safety for a second here because for a big company that would be a showstopper. Okay? You mentioned health and safety and nothing happens anymore. How do you work with your suppliers so they meet your, uh, the health and safety requirements that an international tourist will be expecting? Um, well, um, health and safety, uh, um, safety and security, health and safety, these are, uh, are, are very difficult uh, matters. If you go to health and safety, it is uh, usually common sense and training. These are two things that we employ very much when it comes on the ground. Uh, so common sense, we all have to set that. And then training, we also have to set it. And as I mentioned before, uh, with the uh, Bantu Smart uh, uh, tent camp, we get people, uh, we ask for a local hospitality school, not to give them the, the full one year or four year training, but just give them a course of a week to pre, uh, prepare uh, uh, in a hygienic way uh, um, uh, a meal. And it's usually uh, enough, as long as we track it, it's enough. When it comes to security, it becomes much more political and much more difficult to, uh, okay. to address. Now, a question now for um, Hung you, you, of course, have the same challenge. And at a moment ago, you were talking about the challenge of making sure that the consumers understand what's different about your product and what's unique. But surely then you have the challenge of finding suppliers that are also able to understand how to provide a unique product. How do you work with that? Uh, 얘기하신 부분이 저희가 가장 어려운 것이고요. 특히나 아까 보건 안전 얘기를 하셨는데 그런 기준까지를 충족하는 특히 아시아권에서 아시아 권역에서 그런 파트너들을 찾기는 정말 어려운 일인 것 같습니다. 그래서 이거는 어쩔 수 없이 시간이 필요하고 어, 저희 나름의 방식의 투자가 필요한 것 같아요. 여러 차례 실행해보고 시행착오들을 그 과정에 계속 수정하고 그 다음에 거기서 필요하지만 현지에서 풀지 못하는 어떤 것들 자본이 필요한 문제들에 대해서는 여행사이기도 하지만 그 지역 사회를 개발한다는 입장에서 어, 그런 것을 지원하고 서포트해서 한 단계 좀 업그레이드 시키는 작업까지를 같이 보니까 저희가 한 케이스를 만들 때한 2년 정도는 그런 작업을 같이 해야 정말 의미 있는 성과들이 나오는 것 같아요. 그래서 참 어려운 일인 것 같습니다. Okay. And if I can ask you another question now, now that we're here. Um, your products are also focused on this much more active, personalized. Obviously, the investment on your side to develop products and to develop markets is, is important. Have you now seen a return on investment? Are, are we now at a scale where you can say your business model is profitable? <웃음> 네, 어, 열심히 돈 벌고 있고요. 어, 투자된 돈들은 아직 회수되기에는 좀 빠른 것 저희가 한 7년 차 정도가 됐는데요. 이 여행 상품이라는 게 특히 이제 한국 사람들을 외국으로 보내는 상품들의 경우에 사람들이 인지하고서 그 상품을 알고 나서 구매하기까지도 한 2, 3년의 시간이 걸려요. 그러니까 우리가 개발하는데 2년. 이걸 사람들이 알고 그걸 구매하는 데까지가 또 2년 정도가 걸리기 때문에 하나의 상품을 개발해서 투자를 했다가 회수되기까지의 기간이 굉장히 다른 일반 여행 상품들과 비교할 수 없이 긴것 같습니다. 그래서 아직까지는 좀 감당하고 어, 좀 견뎌야 되는 시기라고 보고요. 다행스럽게도 어쨌든 리턴이 돼서 돈들은 수익이 발생하고 있어서 뭐몇년 정도가 지나면 충분히 좀 해소할 수 있지 않을까 이렇게 생각을 하고 있습니다. Yes, of course. I, I didn't mean to ask you how much money do you have in the bank. <laughs> but um, but do you, do you, what percentage of your customers do you find uh, are loyal to your company and repeat after they book with you? Oh, good. 이게 정확하게 파악하기는 저희도 이제 쉽지가 않은데 여러 고민들을 하고 있지만 보면은 저희가 어, 상품들을 냈을 때 
그러니까 계속 숫자들이 늘어나니까요. 비율을 계산하기가 기준이 되게 애매한데 어쨌든 상품을 운영할 때이 상품의 참여자들 중에 40% 정도는 기존 고객들이 참여를 하세요. 나머지가 어, 이걸 이제 입소문으로 들었거나 어, 인터넷으로 보고 오는 사람들이 나머지 비율들을 차지하고 있어서 어, 저희 고객들은 저희 회사를 보고 팬이라고 표현을 하세요. 고객이라기보다는 우리는 어, 트래블러스 맵의 팬이다라고 표현을 하시는 그러니까 새로운 감성, 느낌들에 대해서 굉장히 어, 선호하시는 경향들은 많이 있으신 것 같습니다. Yeah. And, and I suppose part of the reason why there's a 60% of new travelers is because your company is expanding. Um, so, so I think that's, that's great news. Now, gents, let me come to you for a second. When I saw that video, I thought every company in the Mekong will want that video made for them. How much does it cost me if I want you to make a video like that or a promotional campaign with my company to do that kind of visibility? Do you want me to do a sales pitch or Go tell you how much money I have in the bank? <laughs> No, um, we're still working out the, the packages. Now, I think it's actually a very good question because what we want to do is bring, take the bottleneck away and, and keep the barriers of entry so low that really anybody can participate. Now, it could be someone who, who just says, okay, I, I can't afford a listing or, or all that. We, calculated really on, on ours. So I, I work with, um, with a small marketing company out of Bangkok and, uh, and they're very passionate about that. The, the technology is provided by a company out of Canada. They're very passionate about what we're trying to do, yeah. which is very unique globally. No one has done a campaign like this before. It could go wrong or it could go very big. We did a napkin calculation and said, okay, if only 100 organizations uh, participate, and um, we only do this for 100 days. Um, and we, uh, on average, there are 100 images shared per day. That's a million images yeah. that have never been shared on the Mekong region before globally. Now, when we talked to IHG, they said, absolutely, how can we participate? We talked to a few hotels, and suddenly they discovered that actually within a hotel itself, there could be five, six, seven campaigns can run out of a spa, out of the restaurants, out of all these kind of things. So when you look at the six countries that we have, uh, I mean, my dream is that, yeah, really almost everyone can participate. But so so we want to keep it very low. Now, not everyone, I mean, will have a video, you know. Yeah. Um, not everyone will have a listing. But again, you know, I mean, to create a video like this, uh, it'll uh, maybe take around $500 um, to do that. You know, for, for a hotel, this is not a lot of money. We can customize it. We also provide services to create the campaign and the listing and so on. So again, we're still talking to people like Willem and other ones like, okay, how can we ensure that the barriers are so low that really almost everyone can play in some kind of way or form or other? I mean, I think the only risk is that you'll be totally swamped with work, but how, <laughs> how do you select when a company has a product that is good enough for you to say you are the kind of flagship company you want to put out there, or are you basically saying, look, every company has a positive story, we'll just help you find it? Because I can imagine working with Willem, it would be very easy to find all sorts of really interesting stories in the back of that, but with some other companies, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but you'll be finding it harder to say, look, I mean, your bed looks very similar to everybody else's bed, and there's very little unique here. You know, I think the beauty is of this campaign that it needs to unfold. I think we will learn with that campaign because it has never been done like that before. And that's exciting about it. But uh, I think it's not me that is looking for the story. The story is created by the guests that, exper that experience that product. So if Willem creates uh, a, a trip, and he could have a trip or in a campaign that is different every week, you know, and gives out different prizes. Now then, uh, Namkat Yolapa, you know, they may say, okay, we'll have um, a happy hour every night where we give out a, a glass of wine or something of what has been shared in that day. So it could be mini campaigns, micro campaigns, it could be bigger campaigns. We don't care. We provide the platform to enable anyone to create their own campaign. 
and maybe also help them to kind of get some innovation, some inspiration, but in the end it's, it's the companies or, or, the, or the organization, it could be an NGO, it could even, when we were talking, we said even a taxi driver, sometimes when you're in Bangkok you see some of these crazy tuk-tuks and uh, taxis, even a tuk-tuk driver can create their own campaign, you know, I mean it can be, can be that small. My main concern is that companies in general are really, really lazy, frankly, and very apathetic to change and to embrace new ideas. Most of what we've talked about, my presentation, yours, most of it is common sense. But common sense is not very common. Okay? We're finding that companies just want to say, I did it like this five years ago, and it should work. My job is opening the door of my hotel, and the tourist's job is to walk through that door. And they don't really want to think about how do they get to the door. So how are we going to work with companies to help them become more creative? I, I think the, the measure of success of this campaign really relies on people jumping on board. You're absolutely right. And I've run a lot of campaigns in my life where it is difficult to get engagement. Sometimes if it is so easy, I mean, even when you, uh, I, listen to presentations from TripAdvisor um, and the uptake of people just claiming their listing um, in, in countries, you know, in Australia is, is around 30 percent and, and it's a lot lower in the region. Also, what's more difficult in, in, in our region is that not everyone speaks English as well. Having said that, our strategy is to, to work with organizations that get it, that have reach, um, and that can create sample campaigns that inspire other people. And we think and we hope that that spreads, and that someone else sees it and say, you know what, I can do something myself. You know, I just had a conversation with, uh, with um, the um, DOT, Department of Tourism of the Philippines, that created the uh, It's More Fun in the Philippines campaign. And, and you saw some parallels probably in that video clip. Um, that video clip, wasn't really planned at the beginning. They told me, the undersecretary said, Jens, you gotta touch on the emotions of the people. Why it's more fun the Philippines was successful is because it touched the Filipino people that they believed it's more fun the Philippines is them. And we need to create something in that region that touches people, you know, that they say, okay, there are experiences and moments and memories that we want to share. And if that, I think, gets captured by a few companies like Kiri and other ones, say like, you know what, we can create something and people get inspired, I think that's what we can hope for. And Great. So I think that this has been a fantastic session. I think we've learned an awful lot. We've learned that actually by reducing your budget, taking one zero out of your budget, you probably have to get much more creative. The most of the really good ideas now come from creativity. And then what it takes is that willingness to try things different. We've learned that there's a lot of talk about prices and tourists wanted to drive down prices and all the competition being about being cheaper than your competitor. But actually, there's a lot more to be said for looking at profitability in a different way. And there are discerning customers that want personalized experiences and that we will reach those customers through storytelling and through engaging with them at a human level, as people, and not just as volume and as numbers. Thank you very much to our three panelists. I think we've had three great examples, and you now have a few minutes to try to talk to them during our coffee break. Thank you for the great presentation. Again, thank you, for, uh, thank you to our moderator, Professor Font. So from now on, we are going to have refreshment break and networking time for 10 minutes. So please feel free to get the drinks and snacks and also enjoy the talks. And the next session will begin at 3 o'clock, so make sure to be seated before the time. And now you may leave your seat and enjoy the drinks. Thank you.